With the pandemic, the agricultural value chains suffered major disruptions, threatening the food security all over the world. To engage the first session of the day, we have here with us Vinicius Assis. He is a journalist correspondent in Africa for Global News TV. Let me talk with Vinicius. Hi, Vinicius. Hello. Can you hear me How and you? see me? I'm very fine, thank you. Yes, can you hear me perfectly? Sure, it's perfect. Thank you very much. How are things in South Africa? Well, we are here facing this pandemic, uh, waiting the vaccine, but we are healthy, at least here at home, my home. Uh, this is a very a sunny Wednesday in Johannesburg. Greetings from Johannesburg to everybody. Thank you very much, Vinicius. So feel free to engage our panel. I know that the panelists are already waiting. Thank you very much for joining us, Vinicius, and all the panelists, and please have a nice debate. Yes, well, I'm Vinicius Assis, a Brazilian journalist based here in South Africa, covering the whole Africa for Brazilian media houses. And it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, today and join this online event with, with renowned speakers. Let me introduce you to them, Dr. José Graziano, former Director General of Food and Agriculture Organization, specialized uh, agency of the United Nations. Dr. Michael Kramer, Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 2019. And Dr. Josefa Sacco, Commissioner of the African Union for Rural Economy and Agriculture. Unfortunately, Dr. Mercy Karanja uh, from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation could not join us. She had an, an urgent engagement that she needed to attend to. So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Josefa. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How are you? you? I'm fine, thank you. Where are you now? I'm uh, in uh, Addis Ababa, and uh, I extend warm greeting from Addis Ababa. And good morning, depending on your, geogra your geographic location. Okay, De depending on where the, the, where the audience are, are no? the, like, uh, here in South country. Africa, for example, is good afternoon, but okay. <laughs> and for uh, Brazil, I think it's good morning. Yes, in Brazil, yes, of course. I hope yeah. you're you safe, know, healthy, so facing this pandemic. Yeah. And I would like to link this topic to our panel, no? talking about this pandemic, new coronavirus. How do you think that is the best way to support the vulnerable communities during this pandemic? We at the African Union been uh, since uh, the first uh, uh, reported case in uh, Egypt, we took our responsibility and we came out at, at the front, uh, uh, the forefront to really address the issue of, uh, of uh, this pandemic, this coronavirus, because it's an invisible enemy. We don't know or we don't know. There is no vaccine. There's nothing. But we are really playing a key role of coordination to coordinate you know, the, the, first, uh, the first issue that we tried to see being a disease that came from outside, an imported disease. So at the African Union, we try to create measures to, to, to see measure that we not allow the pandemic to spread, mostly, you know, for poor rural, uh, rural people, vulnerable people, and also the poor in the urban. So we are uh, the department, the, the, my sister, a sister department of social affairs has a big agency, which is uh, the uh, African uh, the, the, uh, CDC, Disease and Control, uh, for, for Disease and Control in Africa. So the CDC is very, very proactive in terms of really bringing support to our, our, our vulnerable people. And also, we don't want the pandemic, you know, uh, the, the sanitary pandemic crisis to become to uh, a, a food crisis. That is why my department, responsible for agriculture, also organized with uh, FAO and key partners involved in the uh, in, uh, agriculture agenda, agriculture transformation agenda. We organize a task force that we are working together in order to really mitigate the effect of uh, of uh, coronavirus on food uh, security and nutrition. Thank you so much. I would like now to go to Dr. Graziano. How are you? 
Can you hear me? Fine, thank you, Vinicius. Where are you now? I am uh, in Campinas, uh, nearby the International Airport of Viracopos, that some of you must the State know. of Sao Paulo. State of Sao Paulo. Okay. Uh, how family farming, farming can be used to reduce poverty in the post-pandemic? Well, <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, you know, the, we have around 500 million family farms around the world. Most of them, we estimate about three quarters of them, poor, very poor some, especially in Africa. The families that are had by women uh, have a small gardens to produce their own food. Uh, they don't afford to do it. So they are poor and some sometimes, most of the time, for me also. Uh, so uh, the way to do it traditionally, uh, we face this problem using uh, three kinds of policies. One is cash transfer. That does not apply only for family farmers or small farmers. Uh, apply for poors to increase their pushes power, their capacity to buy food. Uh, second strategy is to try to make those farmers more, uh, let's say, productive, increase their capacity to produce, uh, giving technical assistance, access to credit, uh, and sometimes new techniques for them. Irrigation is one of the most important that uh, most of the time they don't have possibilities to uh, access to water. So this is the, let's say, the traditional strategy to face uh, poverty among the family farmers. I would uh, like to put two more. One based on our experience in Brazil is to give access to markets, privileged markets. We have in Brazil a program named uh, pushers of family farmers uh, that buy food, fresh food from family farmers to, for school meals, for example, or school programs. That guarantees a market for those farmers. That's the most important problem many they have. But I would say that they're thinking holistically. There is a, a fourth way that is to give subsidies to healthy food produced locally. So would it uh, increase the farmers' uh, inputs uh, and uh, not increase the expense of the consumers and give them more access to healthy food? We can use the money coming from uh, beverage, alcohol, sweet beverage, etc. increase their tax to subsidize the healthy products produced locally by family farmers. I think that's the, if we want the new normal, not to be the same of the, what we know nowadays, that will be a new policy that could be implemented. That will be, the, that is the question. No, we don't know exactly now how will be the new normal. Thank you so much your, for your, your answer. I would like now, I'm gonna go, I'm going to Dr. Michael Kramer, how are you? Fine, thank you. Where are you now? Oh, I'm in Chicago. Chicago. Well, uh, let me ask you, we, we had uh, an opportunity to talk previously, no? And you have a very interesting, uh, uh, you, you have many, many things to talk about technology in agriculture. And I would like to ask you, I think I will make two questions because I think they are connected. How could uh, digital agriculture be improved in the future? Mm -hmm. Remember when we talk about, for example, uh, in Brazil and Africa, where there are some uh, countries where we have people face uh, a not very speed internet and expensive internet, and how might the rise of smartphones change digital agriculture? You have the floor. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, so 
I think um, you know, I've done a work on digital agriculture in in Africa and Kenya and Ethiopia, a little bit in Rwanda, and I've been working with colleagues who've do, been doing work in South Asia and India. So all of these in all of these countries, the primary means most farmers would not have a smartphone, would not have internet access. Most farmers just have a regular phone. You know, most farmers do have a regular phone, but uh, but not a smartphone. And what we found is, even with that basic technology, just very basic SMS messages, um, text messages, or interactive voice systems, those can yield some uh, improvements in adoption of inputs or in improvements in yields that are modest but very very cost effective relative to the the, the very low cost of transmission of the messages. Um, now, you asked, what about, what are the opportunities for the future? I think as more and more people get smartphones and get internet access, be able to do more sophisticated things. Uh, so, for example, you could send video uh, with instructions about farming. You could do more to, you know, there was a, a, a uh, the point about linking farmers to markets. So there, are, in India, there's organizations which are working to link farmers to markets in the city. Um, um, you could integrate in extension workers together with farmers in a single system. Extension workers typically will have smartphones or agro dealers. So I think there's a, a lot of potential going forward as more and more farmers get smartphones. But even now, uh, w without without smartphones, it's still possible to do a lot. Thank you so much. I would like to go again to Commissioner Josefa. I was reading the, the report, uh, Leaving No One Behind, made by FAO and African Union. And it's very interesting. And uh, now, about, uh, now talking about gender equality and the empowerment of rural women and girls, what is the main hurdle to overcome in your opinion? Can you come again? I couldn't hear you. There was uh, some uh, disruption. Uh, okay. The... I was reading the, the, the report, the recent report, Leaving No One Behind, behind made by FAO and African Union, uh, and talking now about gender equality and the empowerment of rural women and girls. What is the, the main hurdle to overcome, in your opinion? In my opinion, the first, uh, the first area that we need to address is uh, really the access to land. And uh, the African Union, we have got a strategy that we have to make sure. And uh, this strategy has that by 2025, we have to have at least 30% 30, uh, 30 of uh, rural women that have documented land, land title. So this is very important. This is the beginning of business. Agriculture is an it is a business. It's not it is not uh, you know it is not a, a poor uh, uh, sector. So if we want to modernize agriculture and taking into account the importance of the participation of women on the farm, we need to give them you know their own access to land and you know access to land once they have the title that can serve as one of. Uh, 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 you know, one of uh, the, the how, do, how do I say it? it? It can serve as a security for them to secure finance at the bank because they have a collateral to 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 bargain with the bank. So it is very important that the woman has her own land and invest on her own land. That is very important, and we are working very very well with the African Development Bank and UNECA and on this on this sense. With the FAO, yes, we are. We have. Uh, we launch on the, the the leadership of uh, uh, Dr. Jose Graziano when he was uh, a, a chairperson. I mean, uh, the director general of FAO. We launched the African strategy for mechanization. This uh, tool is there. Now we need to implement because we know that most of the women in Africa are really suffering to the huge, you know, the dodgery. Uh, and the traditional uh, practice of agriculture. So we want to remove this dodgery. And there was a decision in 2015 in Johannesburg, where you are, the summit, African Union summit, that to put the handhold into the museum. 
it was, uh, you know, a campaign that was launched by a uh, former com uh, chairperson of the commission, Madame Zuma, who launched that campaign that we should confine all the dodgery, all the handholds and hoods to the museum. What did we do as African Union last year? We took it because this was launched in 2015. And late last year in 2019, we launched the ever first inaugural, you know, confining the handhold into the museum in Bobotu Lasso, you know, on the 15th of uh, Africa uh, International uh, Day of Rural Women. So we launched uh, the campaign, it was highly attended. All we invited all the platform of women in agriculture were all there, and uh, they even put a museum, I mean, a status in Bobo Julasso the, at the African Union uh, roundabout to put the statues, and it was really very, very fruitful. And uh, that, that campaign, that commemoration brought out a, 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 a call for a, a platform on women on agriculture. So we're supposed to come, that was the region of West Africa, we're supposed to have this year in uh, Southern Africa, but COVID did not allow us, we just uh, did uh, some uh, 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 webinar, you know, on the activity, but we are still on that, uh, on that aspect so that we can take that uh, uh, strategy on mechanization and the mechanization is not just tractor, it's along all the agricultural value chain. You know, to bring, you know, uh, mechanized uh, tools for women and to, you know, really lessen their hardship work on the farm. Thank you so much. Dr. Graziano would like to talk about uh, this topic when we talk about women, women empowering issues. issues. Well, uh, this is uh, crucial not only for Africa farmers, uh, for the world, I would say. Uh, we needed to increase gender balance all over the world, all over all activities. Uh, there is a huge discrimination against women in different sectors, particularly in agriculture. Uh, culturally, uh, uh, subsistence agriculture is for women in Africa. It is difficult to find women doing to uh, commercial crops, for example, or for uh, herbs. Uh, this is, uh, let's say, a man activity, traditionally. Uh, we need to change that. And uh, let me say that in Africa, women are very important for local markets. The role of women in local markets are fundamental for uh, access to food for all the people, in the cities, in the rural areas, everywhere, even across borders. The marketing across borders is one of the most important in uh, all the continent. Here in Brazil, we face the same problem with the difference that women is not so uh, linked to farming. It's more in uh, domestic activities, like uh, taking care of the kitchens, of the cow that produce milk and uh, small gardens, small plots. Uh, but now this is changing. Uh, farmers, small farmers organization are promoting women and uh, uh, worker, and this has increased and changed a lot their participation in their rural uh, labor force. Thank you so much. Dr. Kramer, let's talk more about technology and how can we, 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 we learn with uh, in other experiences. Now, so I would like to ask you, how can countries learn from the experience of other countries with digital agriculture? Right, I, I think this is uh, an exciting uh, exciting area. I'm working with, uh, I, I helped, uh, after doing research in this area, I helped found an NGO called Precision Development. And uh, Precision Development, we, we started out working in Kenya and India. Um, 
once we had that experience, uh, we started working with the government of Ethiopia, um, uh, Rwanda, uh, other governments. And one thing we found is that there, there are some similar lessons. So I'll give an example from, from South Asia. Um, in India, we found that the government had actually gone and done soil testing to assess the chemistry of the soil in many, many farms. And they were going to distribute that information to the farmers on soil health carts. Well, we, we went to the farmers and it turned out farmers could really not understand the information on the soil health carts. They, it was just presented in a way that was very difficult for farmers to understand. So you know, we showed that data to the, to the government. Uh, the government was you know, shocked at this because they had spent millions of dollars on this effort. And then we worked with the government to redesign the soil health cards so they were more understandable. And then to arrange for a short vi uh, audio message to be played through the phone to the farmer to explain the content of that card. And with that, the comprehension rates of the farmers went up dramatically. Well, then we started working in Pakistan. They too had a soil health uh, uh, card program that they were about to roll out. And because of the experience in India, we were able to find very similar issues in Pakistan. And also in Pakistan, the government actually, you know, this was a, actually, I think in both cases, really a lot of uh, you know, bravery on behalf of the civil servants because you know, the politicians wanted to get these 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 uh, these programs going, but when they saw that they needed to be delayed, and and uh, they went ahead and did that so they could have a better product. So um, so I think uh, we we really are learning across contexts, and you know the same thing is happening in Africa as well. Uh, Precision Development recently started working in Brazil, and I'm sure there'll be lessons from Brazil for Africa, from Africa for Brazil. Um, I, it's a very exciting area. And talking about this. And I will do one more question to you, Dr. Kramer. How can Brazil and Africa learn from one another? Well, I think there's going there. There are, I think there there are going to be important similarities. Um, obviously, Brazil has a, a lot of success in agricultural extension. Um, Brazil also and agricultural research. Brazil has uh, will have a, a higher level of smartphone penetration. And I think, as we were discussing before, I think one of the most exciting things for the future is to figure out how can we optimize use of the smartphones. And that can be not just communication from the government to the farmer, but communication among the farmers. They can exchange information with each other. You want that to be accurate information rather than non-accurate information. So you're a journalist. I'm sure there, there are a lot of uh, issues we'll have to work through. Uh, but... Um, you know, the, the, the technological opportunities, you could take pictures of pests. Imagine you have a pest and you don't know what, what pest that is. Take a picture of it, send it. it could, the data could be analyzed by, by artificial intelligence to help identify the pest. The central government could then get information, which parts of the country have which pests. You could send alerts to people in the relevant areas saying, okay, there's a lot of this particular pest in your area. You should react to it. So I think, uh, you know, uh, I think there's really going to be lots of opportunities in the future. And I think you know, whether it's Brazil, whether it's Kenya, whether it's India, I think we can all learn from each other. Thank you very much. I would like to, to extend this question to other speakers. Commissioner, you first. How can Brazil and Africa learn from one another? I think there is a lot of uh, uh, cultural proximity between uh, Brazil and Africa to start with. Uh, so we, we have a lot to learn from Brazil. Brazil is a very big country and uh, it's well organized in terms of agriculture. We have uh, some key areas that uh, we can get, learn a lot. L let me talk about my previous, uh, my previous life in coffee. Brazil is the first worldwide coffee producer so this is a lesson that uh, you know we we need to really strengthen this type of uh, cooperation and uh, in the coffee industry a lot of uh, cooperation between brazil and a lot of uh, african uh, uh, producing uh, coffee producing countries let me name we have uh, with cote d'ivoire with Senegal, uh, with cote d'ivoire 
with uh, Uganda, with uh, Kenya, Angola. I'm, I'm not even talking about you know the the, the uh, Portuguese or Lusophone countries. So we have a very very uh, you know interest to have a close collaboration. We work a lot uh, you know with Embrapa. Embrapa is there, so we, through Embrapa we can really you know strengthen this type of cooperation and learn because there's a lot we can learn. So just to give you a recent example, because uh, uh, we're talking about agriculture, and in the last uh, three years, uh, this, the, this sector has been getting a lot of shocks apart from the pandemic. We had three great shocks on the continent. The first one was the fall I mean, warm, and the second is the cricket last year, and now the pandemic. During the fall I mean, warm, all the African, the African Union with the uh, Imbrapa, we organized, you know, a visit, a, to a, to a tour in uh, Brazil to go and see how, how, how do you mitigate the effect of uh, the fall and the warm in Brazil. So we a lot of plantations and we saw all the recipe, all the re recipe that, uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, the menu, we can say the menu. happy with the experience of Brazil. So we went there, we organized with the USID, all of us, and then we saw that if Brazil, you know, uh, Brazil can stand for more than four decades, you know, with uh, the fall and the warm, Africa can also, but, you know, getting a good lesson, good lesson and lesson practices from Brazil. So I, I, I am really very, very optimistic about this cooperation and, uh, uh, Brazil Africa Forum should really come out with more and more expertise and explore it so that we can gain a lot from the experience of uh, this big old almighty Brazil that it is. I thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me do a comment. I'm so happy when someone from different countries, different country, uh, talk about Brazilian coffee. But I need to, to talk to particularly, I don't drink coffee. Uh, maybe I'm a fake Brazilian because uh, worldwide people, Brazilian coffee is still being famous, but I'm sure Dr. Graziano uh, will. Vinicius. We have lost contact with our panelists. I don't know. Maybe we are going to try to... During the day. Uh, I usually wake up about 5 o'clock in the morning. So that helps a lot to keep uh, uh, a good humor during the day. But, uh, uh, well, uh, Josefa spoke uh, about the international cooperation, Brazil and Africa. Uh, I have to say that nowadays we don't see the same appetites in Brazilian government to cooperate with Africa country, unfortunately. But in the past, especially during the tenure of uh, Lula's government between 2003 and 2010, uh, the, there, is, uh, there was a, a, a priority to assist African countries. And she mentioned Embrapa. Uh, Embrapa, uh, we, uh, at the ta that time, we had uh, a, 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 a filial of Embrapa in Ghana with uh, President Kufur, that was a good friend of Lula and was awarded with the uh, uh, Nobel Prize, uh, uh, Food Nobel Prize uh, in Iowa. Uh, so uh, the transfer of policies, especially transfer of technologies, are fundamental. And is uh, learning, mutual learning, because Imbrapa learned a lot uh, with this technical assistance in Africa. Let me just give an example. The most important grass that we have nowadays in Brazil, pastures, came from Africa, brachiaria, the different species of brachiaria, is imported from 
Africa and uh, genetic improved in Brazil. And I have uh, many examples of that. Even a uh, very important disease of coffee plantation, that's the roost, was firstly identified in Africa. And uh, there was adapted of plants, the resistance to uh, dust uh, to use in Brazilian coffee plantations. So, uh, most of the times, this international cooperation is a mutual learning. <laughs> uh, it's not only a country that gives something and the other that receives. This is interation. And I strongly believe in that. And when, during my tenure in uh, FAO, that was also our priority, increase South-South cooperation. This is the way forward. Dr. Kramer. Thank you, Dr. Garziano. Dr. Kramer, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you drink coffee? I, yes, it's, it was very early here when we started, 5.45, so I, I had some coffee. I don't know what, uh, and I, I guess that's one of the advantages of traveling. I, uh, I, uh, I was, when I was working in Ethiopia, I drank uh, Ethiopian coffee, which I, I was wonderful. And uh, um, so and I was just in India and, and I met the, uh, the, the head of the, we don't think of India as a big coffee producer, but uh, by the head of the coffee uh, board there, and they've, they're actually using technology quite a bit. Um, so uh, yes, I'm a, I'm a fan of coffee. Yes, Ethiopian coffee is, there, is, is famous as well. But let me uh, talk about another subject to you. Um, I would like to ask you, what is the, the, the role for, for governments, NGOs, and private companies, companies for digital agriculture? I think they all have important roles. Um, you know, one thing, um, one, let me, let me, I've been very positive, so let me actually just put some realism here, though. Um, I think there are some companies have thought, or some startups have thought, well, we're going to do digital agriculture and we're going to finance it by selling subscriptions to farmers. The farmers will pay us to give them text messages. Uh, um, that strategy has, I don't want to claim never works, but it's very difficult. And you know, I've, I think there are a lot more failures than there are successes. I think if we want to make this succeed, it probably has to be free for the farmer. And the, you know, the natural organization, if we think about agricultural extension, governments are very involved in agricultural extension in face-to-face. -face. You know, we're now in a time of COVID-19 we can't do face-to-face -face agricultural extension. That's a crisis, but it's also an opportunity because many of the things we do to deal with crises are things that you know, are temporary. And then when the crisis is over, you know, we, we, we have to readjust. In this case, part of adjusting to the crisis will be governments supplementing in-person agricultural extension with digital agricultural extension. But then after the crisis, after the pandemic, then we can integrate together both the, both the, the digital extension direct to the farmer together with uh, the agricultural extension systems. I guess you know, another aspect of the private sector that can be very important is the telecommunications companies. So for example, in Kenya, you know, the, the, we meant fall armyworm came up. The, 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 the Ministry of Agriculture asked the main telecommunication company, Safaricom, to help provide messages to educate farmers about fall armyworm. Well, S Safaricom went ahead and did that. And so that in Ethiopia as well, the telecommunications company has been very involved in providing free messages for the government to distribute agricultural information. So I think active involvement of the telecommunications uh, industry is, is, can play a big role. And then NGOs. You know, I've, we've been working with One Acre Fund. They're active in, in, in Rwanda, and Kenya, much of, of Eastern uh, Africa. You know, they, are, they communicate with the farmers, obviously face-to-face, -face, but they've been supplementing those messages with text messages, and we've been working with them to design them, but also to do A-B tests, to test the impact. And what, what they've seen consistently is 
with those messages, they get higher uptake of the inputs that, they're, that they and that, the, for example, the Rwandan government are encouraging farmers to use. So I think all of these organizations have a role. Thank you so much. Commissioner, uh, would you like to, to talk about this, this question? I think uh, uh, Professor Michael made a, a very good point. Today, with uh, the, uh, you know, lesson learned from the uh, COVID, we cannot work alone. All this technology, we have to work in coordination. Everybody has to be on board and work together. Because we know that, uh, you know, the digitalization has proof that is a very important tool. We, now, with COVID, nobody can travel, but we can still maintain our business, you know, our business as usual, you know. We are, you know, uh, having uh, conferences, uh, life did, did not stop, we're having conferences. So this is the, this is the real strong of this uh, digitalization revolution. Of, of course, it can have an impact uh, on some sectors. Like with COVID, we cannot travel, Okay, the, 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 I mean, the air transports are losing a lot. Tourism, they are losing a lot. But on the other hand, you know, we are making a lot of savings, you know, on not traveling and we still continue doing our, our work with the, this uh, digital uh, revolution. Uh, Professor also is right when he said that uh, there is this issue of, uh, of uh, uh, farmers not having access to smart phone because if we want to really you know be e e efficient on digitalization we have to look at the infrastructure which infrastructure these rural areas have this is a really key you know some of them they don't even have internet coverage so if there is a lot of things that we need to bring you know all this ecosystem so that things will work we know that it is very e efficient and effective but how do, do, do you turn uh, transmit it to the rural area. Those are the people that we are concerned in terms of uh, improving their livelihoods. That is why in African Union last year, on the, still uh, uh, Dr. Graziano was there, Jose was uh, uh, the director, we signed a, a, you know, a, a rural Africa with the EU. We signed a rural Africa and we're looking at the dim dimension of territorial you know, approach so that we can bring all this ecosystem at the rural area and people have access to all these facilities. If we don't do it, we are going to marginalize. Like you said, our report, we are going to leave people behind. We are saying leave no one behind. You know, everybody should be on board. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Graziano. Uh, what is the, the role for governments, NGOs, and private companies for digital agriculture for you? Well, uh, Benicio, let me take one point that raised uh, Dr. Kramer. Things that we do during a crisis uh, became most of the time permanent after the crisis. And I have to give it a good example using digital technology that we saw proliferate here in Brazil. That is the use of platforms to approach consumer and producers. Most of the small farmers, when the pandemic started, they lose their markets. Uh, because there were informal markets that were forbidden due to the agglomeration, farm, uh, farm markets, basically. So uh, uh, NGOs uh, started to promote some platforms that bring together a group of consumers and producers to sell their products. And one of the most interesting organizations, one called CSA, Community Support uh, Agricultures, Community Support Agriculture. It's a group of consumers uh, from a building for a, a football a team or something, a group of consumers that get together to buy from a cooperative or from a consumer using their smartphones or using a platform that was developed. So any, uh, many startups, including uh, some uh, 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 private companies, started to develop those platforms that are available for uh, 
small farmers to sell their products or to integrate with consumers and to buy them. Even to uh, finance, to give credit to the producers during this time was organized to those platforms. So really, the acceleration of digital information nowadays during the pandemic is something that we need more attention and we need to work more on it because this is really a new normal that we wanted to preserve. Thank you very much. I'm learning a lot. I would like, we don't have too much time, but I, I, I need to talk about one topic, specific topic, uh, especially here in South Africa. Uh, when we talk about investment from uh, private companies, for example, we should, uh, uh, we should uh, talk, about, talk about one topic, uh, how to convince these private companies, for example, to invest in countries like South Africa, while we're still facing racial issues from rural areas. Commissioner Josefa, please. Uh, in terms of, uh, this is a very complex. Uh, complex, uh, no? Very complex. Uh, you were talking about uh, come again, come again. <laughs> let me, let me, because I was not expecting to be asked this question. Can you come again? Okay, Dr. Graziano would like to talk uh, to the no, comment. I can talk about it, but come ah. again. I, I, lost ah, okay. my, I lost my reasoning. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, would you, uh, how to convince uh, private okay. companies, for example, yes. to invest? Uh, because it's a critical topic. Uh, uh, yes, it's a critical topic. And it's still being, uh, I'm facing this problem here in South Africa. And day by day, we receive news from conflicts, no racial issues, racial conflicts in, uh, from rural areas. And I think it's, uh, it's an important topic to discuss. Yes, because at the African Union, we are really trying to see how we can capture the, uh, you know, or, or how we can engage with the, with the investor, mostly the private sector, to come in into, into the business. For them to come, I think it's a matter of uh, clear policy has to be has to be put in place has to be put in place because today you cannot uh, you know come with a racist racist xenophobia uh, type of attitude we are all we want to build the Af Af africa we want we have agenda 2063 and with this we have to put all the conducive you know business environment and policies so that people will have insurance and they will come and invest that is number one even those communities, they have to know if they have a land, they can do a lot of things. They can go through cooperatives, they can go to, to uh, 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 you know, some joint, uh, joint uh, uh, how do they call it, there is a the joint agreement with the private sector to come and export their land. So there are a lot of opportunities in that area. But the policy has to be properly, properly set so that we can avoid any destruction on this sector. I think it's a very important point because we need to attract, you know, we need to attract the, uh, the, the investors, even local domestic investors, as, as we start with this. But we have the problem too. And our land policy, our land policy has to be clear, has to be clear, has to be well, well, well formulated. And that policy of land has to be well formulated so even the locals, the, the, the indigenous, they have advantage, you know, in working with big companies that want to go and work and invest in this sector. So I think all this is a matter of good policy and good strategy. Dr. Graziano? Well, uh, I see that uh, uh, post-pandemia, we will see a redesign of the global markets. Uh, particularly in agriculture, particularly for commodities, uh, these uh, long chain producers commodities uh, will be affected. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, more local production will be stimulated. Uh, short circuits, uh, local products like uh, zero kilometer uh, will be a part of the future of local communities. And this will attract more local investments, international or 
local, uh, there will be need for more investments at country level. But uh, this will basically depend, in my opinion, on the political situation of the country, uh, and uh, especially, let's say, the uh, background uh, that could uh, support uh, the investors, uh, the legal framework, the financial situation, and all these things that uh, give security for uh, uh, investors. So uh, countries that are facing problems like South Africa and Brazil, uh, with huge levels of extreme poverty, violence in rural areas and urban and peri-urban areas, certainly will not be at the top of the list for international investors. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask Caroline if we have uh, questions from our audience, or can I? Yes, yes, Vinicius, indeed we ask have. Asking our speakers. Yes, we have received lots of interactions and we have some really interesting questions here. Uh, let me ask, this is one from Elton Pletches. Does 60% of the road's arable land still mean something towards alleviating poverty? Maybe I don't know if Dr. Graziano wants to address this one. Caroline, could you please repeat the number of the arable land you use? 60%. Does 60% of the road's arable land still mean something towards alleviating poverty? Well, uh, you know, uh, part of the poverty issue in rural areas is access to land. Uh, but not only land. Nowadays, lands not means exactly all for farmers. You need land, you need water, you need credit, you need technical assistance. The problem of uh, poor farmers is, is that they lack land, but they lack also technical assistance, credit, uh, everything. Even digital technologies access. So uh, I, I think that it is important rural reform programs that's still ongoing, for example, in countries like South Africa, uh, are very important to give better access and to uh, uh, access to land to the farmers. But uh, I would say that uh, this needs to be complemented with uh, policies pro-poor. Pro-poor policies are fundamental to change the game. We have an equal land distribution, of course, but we have also an equal uh, uh, distribution of all important assets. Uh, so these need to be addressed simultaneously, not only land. Sure, thank you. Uh, one more. This is for anyone who'd like to address, maybe the commissioner, Josefa. Would you please comment on the urban side of food security? Rapid urbanization in Africa is bringing challenges to food security in enormous cities such as Lagos or Kinshasa. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very good question. What we have to, as, as a policy at the African Union, is to really reduce the rate of importation. You ask a question, the 60% arable land, most of it are in Africa, this arable land. But why are we, you know, uh, spending four, 40, 45 billion dollars annually to import food when we have the ecosystem to produce food? So it, once we change this narrative, we change this way of doing things, you know, we have to change, you know, business as usual. We have to go to new innovative uh, forms of producing. So this is a very, 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 very complex issue on the continent that, the, that we are fit, 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 facing on our continent. We have to be a country like Nigeria. I have a chance to, to, to study there. I did my university uh, degree there in, in, in Nigeria, and I did agriculture. They have a lot of capacity to produce. But since, you know, they have oil, 
they diverted from you know concentrating on agriculture and feed their people because they have revenues to import food. That is why they neglected agriculture. And in Congo, Congo is a huge potential with water, forest, name it. It's one of the richest countries on the continent. But because of policy, because of uh, insecurity of the country, things are not moving. So, the, so we need to really, you know, like uh, Graziano said uh, very rightly, we need to reformulate, you know, the post-COVID is really starting, we need to refocus, you know, our structure, mostly the agriculture sector. That is why it is important what we are doing, you know, we are organizing, you know, the summit on food system. All this is, you know, is a global issue, is a ecosystem of the food system. So we really need to change things and and be, you know, be able to really feed our people because the population in Africa is going to increase by 2050 to 2 billion. So if China, that has a population of 1.4 million billion, as you know, is so as a food sufficient, you know, food security is is really ensured. Why can't we in Africa with all this ecosystem, with all this, you know, water, land, we have all this. Why can't we make, you know, why can't we make a change on the continent? China is feeding its population. Why can't Africa feed? Why can't Nigeria feed its population? Why can't Congo with 80 million people uh, feed its population? So the, 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 those are the type, but all this, it's about priority. What is your priority? What is your plan as a government so that you can really, you know, thrive the potential you have in your country, in your country and feed your people? Because the urban, the demand for food is increasing. So how are we going to do it? So it is all, in all you know, areas that you have to look, you know, increase productivity, increase, uh, you know, link the, the market, modern agriculture, all these have to be there for you to meet that goal of feeding and zero hunger. Like Graziana said, you know, when we're talking about Imbrapa, it was President Lula that brought zero hunger here in Africa. And that is why in our CADEP, PP, you know, CADEP, our flagship program on Agenda 2063, we said that by 20, while the SDG is saying by 2030 we should end hunger, 2030. But we said by 2025, we have to end anger. And we learned a lot from Brazil. But this is an initiative. Graziano was a, a you know, FO. He, they brought it, and we are following that uh, uh, that scheme or that good, uh, good lesson of Brazil to do things and change the narrative in Africa. I will stay with you, Commissioner, because there's also a comment related with that. The urban population tends to consume not family agriculture products, but industrialized ones full of sugar and salt, increasing the risk of disease such as diabetes and obesity. So this is uh, really an issue to address right now. Uh, you, know, you know, because of poverty, Africa doesn't consume all these things you're saying, all these uh, industrialized products. Because of poverty, mostly Af African agriculture is is really organic. It's organic because we cannot afford to go and buy those products that are industrialized with a lot of sugar, with a lot of diabetics. We are aware of it and we are not encouraging. We are not encouraging and we want to keep our own uh, traditional dishes, you know, in the family. In terms of uh, when we we want to use our own, we don't want to lose our own traditional norms and values of eating our own food, which is very, very rich in vitamins, minerals, call it. So that is why I'm saying we don't eat hamburgers and we are not encouraging our children to start, you know, go to McDonald's. No, we eat real food. You know, we are eating real food and we are you know, on our nutrition program. We want to make sure that we use our own indigenous knowledge and an indigenous product to feed our population. We think that is more healthy. And now with COVID, we can see, with COVID, we are doing a lot of prevention, you know, with our own this in ginger, you know, local, local uh, products to, to really mitigate the impact, uh, the effect of uh, COVID on our, on, on our diet. 
Thank you, Commissioner. On this path of improving health, uh, we have received a comment from Eni Kairaba. She said, indeed, there should be more investment in urban agriculture, too, for women, so they can enjoy the urban life, especially for the children, as well as contribute to food security. Improving health is also related with that. So I will address this one to Dr. Kramer, because your work is uh, simply amazing, Dr. Kramer, that one related with dewarming children, improving their health. This is really special. I particularly hope that Brazil can be inspired by your work and the Brazil Africa Institute is also really interested in stay in contact with you and talking to you related to that. But improving health using these technology tools, is it possible? How do you feel that now with the pandemic, this sector is going to move on in Africa? So, you know, one, one example, you mentioned deworming, um, you know, obviously food uh, production is one half of the, of the equation or a critical part of the equation for nutrition and health, but there are also, we also have to think about uh, water, sanitation, and how that can affect you. Know, diarrhea is a huge killer of, of children, and uh, worms can affect nutritional status, cause anemia. So many countries have following the World Health Organization recommendation in areas where intestinal worms are common. They've created programs so that all school children are getting uh, pills against the deworming. These are very cheap, uh, pennies per dose. So this is, uh, you know, many African countries have done this. Uh, that Brazil has, has done this. Um, I think where one issue is children are no longer going to school they're not getting this medicine anymore. So thinking about, because they're not going to school because of COVID. So we have to think about how are we going to deliver this essential health care during this time. And of course, another huge challenge is going to be uh, once, when, once a COVID vaccine is developed, then how can we ensure that all countries get access to this? Some countries, I believe Brazil is one of them, have moved early to try to negotiate with the manufacturers to get to make sure that once a vaccine is developed, they'll have access. That means actually installing the capacity now, because otherwise there'll just be a shortage even after we have a vaccine. So Brazil's, US, UK, other high-income countries have made those deals, but it, this is something that doesn't have to be limited to the high-income countries. Brazil has, has done this. I think that African countries, should, some African countries, for example, South Africa, it would also make sense uh, to, uh, to, to make such deals to assure supply of the COVID vaccine once it's developed. Uh, for Dr. Graziano, would it be possible to come up with some thoughts on the importance of land reform in Brazil and also in African countries? This one is from Afroeducação. Well, uh, the uh, land reform uh, is a long reunification from the uh, small farmers organizations in Brazil. Uh, but I have to say that the last uh, Brazilians government do not pay enough attention to it. So nowadays, I would say that it's completely stopped and uh, the policy has been dismantled. Uh, about the South Africa, uh, as far as I know, there was a deci political decision to start uh, a land reform process uh, in South Africa with collaboration with FAU, our representative in South Africa, Mr. Francesco Pieri, was chosen by me as a specialist in land reform process. Uh, in uh, uh, South African countries. Uh, but unfortunately, he has moved out uh, with the new administration. So I don't have any new insights about that. What I know is that access to land is fundamental. Uh, in the future, uh, we will need to stop this rural urban migration or at least disaccelerate it. Uh, in the past, we used to believe that as much as people that we could move from rural areas to the city 
will be better for them. And now we are uh, uh, seeing that that's not true anymore because they cannot find jobs in urban areas anymore. They are not prepared for that. So better to keep them in rural areas, but keep them with a dignity condition to not only survive, but to do their work and to prosper the family. This is the idea of a land reform process. So I think this is a window of opportunity that opens with the post pandemia to restart thinking land reform process. And with a new uh, characteristic, there is not need too much land as in the past. We can do land reform process with small plots, small pieces of land that gives a house to nucleate the farm, the family, and people can live there and start to search for jobs and work and produce their own food also. So this is a new kind of land reform perspective that opens in the post pandemic situation for Latin American countries and for African countries in particular. I have to say that Asian countries, most of them, has done that. They have a different land tenure structure of small plots. That's exactly what I'm proposing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Graziano, for these insights. Indeed, uh, land reform is uh, more complex issues. I don't know if Vinicius would like to address some final thoughts on this, because we have such an amazing panel. These are amazing panelists. I have to say personally also that I have been following the work of Dr. Graziano, uh, who was with me last year in the Brazil Africa Forum in Sao Paulo. Dr. Graziano, I don't know if you remember, but I have the pleasure to moderate your panel last I year. Do. It was such a joy for me. And also the work of Of course the, I do. Yeah. <laughs> also the work of the commissioner, really special, really inspiring also. And of course, Dr. Michael Kramer, who is changing all this way related with technology and improving the life of people in such a very specific scenarios as we have in Africa. So maybe Vinicius, I don't know if you would like to address some final remarks, some final comments on we just have listened on the panel. Yes, I have just one last one last question, maybe uh, to finish our very nice and productive uh, panel. Uh, what is the best way to eradicate hunger in Brazil and African countries? Maybe can uh, digital agriculture reach the poorest farmers? Commissioner, would like to address this question? Commissioner Josefa, can you hear me? It appears that uh, the freeze yeah. the day. Ah, uh, yeah, Dr. Graziano, can you can well, address this? With pleasure. I would say that Brazil has the most, uh, has implemented the most successful eradication uh, policy, uh, hunger eradication policy. That is the Fome Zero, or Zero mm -hmm. Hunger program. We took uh, about 40 million people out of hunger in, uh, in less than 10 years, and we eradicate uh, hunger in Brazil. Uh, nowadays, hunger is back, because unfortunately, the last government didn't pay attention. Uh, uh, food security and nutrition policy must be state policies, not government policy. It, it, it must not depend on the government in turn. It must be supported constitutionally, like it is in Brazil, but in for, unfortunately, the last two governments did not pay attention, so Brazil is back to hunger. But uh, it's possible to do it. We showed how to do it. Let me just uh, have a, a commercial approach, if you may. Uh, we just launched the Instituto Fome Zero, Zero Hunger Institute. You can find our website, in, uh, zerohungerinstitute.org or zero hunger or instituto fome zero .org, 
in the web to see our manifesto and the action that we are planning. So this is something that uh, the society must agree to, is the society that eradicates hunger, not the government. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Josefa is back. Can you hear me? I'm back here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm having a small problem with network. No yeah. problem. Uh, this is our new normal. <laughs> well, uh, what is the best way to eradicate hunger in Brazil and in African countries for you? Our last question. In order to eradicate hunger, we really have to make sure that. Uh, First of all, we, uh, we transform our agriculture on the continent, the agriculture transformation. We have the flagship program, which is the CADEP program, and we have the target. On the target, we know what to do. So if we, bring, if we invest on this sector, we invest on uh, research and development innovation, I think we can eradicate longer. That is where the problem is. There is no investment in agriculture. So when you don't invest, how will you produce? I think. This is a uh, issue in. Yeah. You're up. We can't hear you right now, Commissioner. So. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. let's follow up for Dr. Kramer Vinicius as we wait for yes. the connection of Dr. Josefa to establish a little bit. Yeah. Can you hear me, Commissioner? Okay, Dr. Kramer. So you have the floor. Can you, okay. can digital agriculture reach the poorest farmers? Poorest, poorest farmers, maybe? Well, you know, I, I think I really agree with both of the previous panelists. I think that both both elements that they were emphasizing are very important to reaching the goal of zero hunger. One hand, um, as, as the commissioner was just uh, pointing out, we need agricultural growth, we need increased productivity, uh, we need increased access to markets. Um, but, you know, as, as I also agree that we need a robust safety net. And cash transfers can indeed be a very important uh, part of that safety net. Uh, the, you know, one of the things that I think is, is important and we're realizing right now is you know, agriculture is subject to all sorts of, of, sh of shocks. I mean, we, we heard the examples, fall armyworm, locusts, you know, now we have COVID. These things are, are, are difficult to predict. Farmers. We need systems in place to help farmers when they do occur, obviously weather and climate shocks. So part of that, look, part of that is just having a, a good agricultural policy and a good safety net policy. Uh, those, are, those are fundamental. I do think that, and, and you know, I don't want to overstress the importance of technology, but I do think technology can contribute even there. Because if we can monitor where the weather, pro where are we seeing a drought, where are we seeing a uh, harvest fail, and some of that can be done with technology, uh, with satellite imagery, then if people have, if we have access, for example, India has now got every person registered in their, through their Aadhaar system. They have a unique identification number. If you know where people are, and if you have this type of unique identification number, we can now quickly transfer people money, either, you know, if necessary, through their mobile phones. Um, and then that, that can, not everybody has mobile phones. We can't immediately go fully to that. But India now has a very, has really set up a, a safety net system that because of this unique identification number that people have, they've really dramatically reduced uh, waste and fraud in that system, and they can transfer money to people uh, when needed. So I think moving towards that type of system uh, in Africa could really be very important in, in, in the fight against hunger. Thank you very much. Commissioner Josefa, are you there? Can you hear me? I think no, Caroline. Oh, so I think sorry. I we came back to you, unfortunately. Uh, no, yeah, so sorry. 
Well, maybe we have reached the, the end of the debate, so I only would like yeah. to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Josef. I hope you can hear us at least, Dr. Graziano. Hello, no, 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 yes. it's okay. no, it's okay. No, it's okay. No, it's, oh, no, it's okay. Please, Commissioner. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. No. Thank you for finding an alternative. <laughs> you can please no, address your final phone. thoughts. I'm now using my phone. Now, yeah, it's perfect again. Thank you very much. We are just uh, ending up the debate. So if you please uh, can only con conclude your thoughts. To me, it was a very, very uh, stateful and we had a very good uh, exchange. And uh, I think that uh, at the African Union, we are really committed to look post pandemic yes, solution. Uh, we have already, we are working on that, uh, you know, we want to build back better and greener. So we are going to, to do it and uh, we want uh, uh, the new normal to happen on the continent. And, uh, you know, we are really committed to look at all the challenges we are facing in terms of uh, 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 food, uh, uh, food security and nutrition on our continent. Perfect. Thank you for the message, Commissioner. So please, Vinicius, you can end up your session. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you, Dr. Kramer, Commissioner Josefa, Dr. Jose Graziano, and all of our audience. Sorry for my accent, but I think it was uh, productive. And thank you for the chance I have to learn. I, I learned very much uh, uh, interesting things here today. Caroline. Thank you, Vinicius. And I, I want just to add something. You mentioned that you don't drink coffee. So am I. So I think you, we are the only two Brazilians in the world who don't like coffee very much. <laughs> <laughs> just to end up with a few more. Yes. Thank you very much.